I have literally four laptops here. My notebook won't open. My new computer doesn't have WebEx. I am ready to start drinking. <laughs> it's, it's, five o'clock. it's not even five o'clock. It's five o'clock somewhere, right? All right, so we're recording. All right, um, Rachel, Don, hey, Don, how are you? Hope you have a glass of wine. I, I will soon. I will soon. Okay. <laughs> Did I show you my... Uh... Nice. nice. Very nice. More. There's more. There's way more. <laughs> yeah, I have that problem, too. Yeah. Well, it's not really a problem. No. no. Anyway, great. Right. Okay, let's uh, get this going. So I want to go over chapter uh, 19. So, um, like, Clostridium and Bacillus, and then we have two more classes, correct? I not losing my mind completely. You're the teacher. <laughs> what, what do you say? I'm the teacher. Yeah. Well. yeah you, you decide. Yeah, that's debatable. All right, let me uh, hit share. Okay. Uh, Doctor Phil, I have a quick question. Yeah, of course. Um, I've been emailing you these last couple weeks, and I haven't gotten a response on any of them. And one of them. Where, where are you? To your ECC email. Really? To, for... um, I was asking, I forget what the other questions were, but the most recent one was the Chapter 15 PowerPoint. Whenever I tried downloading it off of Blackboard, it'd say it only had like 10 slides in it, which doesn't feel right. No, that's not right at all. Is any... You could just email it or repost it. That would be beneficial because I'm copying the slides for like studying for the test. And I just haven't been able to continue my notes. This is what chapter? 15. Let me grab a pen. Hold on. So literally like Blackboard is crashing everywhere. It's crashing on all of my courses right now. So nothing is going to shock me. So 15. That should be on um, immunity. Mm -hmm. All right. So was anyone else having the same problem or no? I think I had it all. Hold on. I, I have all slides. Okay. All right. Um, why is this not working? All right. So I want to hit share. Okay. We have the same problem there. All right. Can you guys see that? Nope. There's not. No. It's like, okay. I literally got a new computer from ECC, told them I need it for WebEx, sent it to me, doesn't have WebEx loaded. Yeah, see, I my 15, I have like 65 pages. All right. Uh, uh, how do I do that? I, I can send, Katarina, I can send it to you in like um email? Yeah, that's fine. Yes, I guess. I don't know. Okay. All right. Screen. Yeah. Yay. Yeah, but now I have nothing to do back. Hmm. All right, hold on. Is that good? Yeah. That's working? Mm-hmm. Okay. Good. All right. <clears throat> Let me start this. All right, I will do one chapter because I know. Oh no, where's everybody go? You guys, can you guys see me? Yeah. And you can see the screen. Yeah. I can yep. see nothing. Okay. All right. Whatever. I have no idea what it look like, but it doesn't matter. All right. So uh, we'll do one uh, chapter because I know all these uh, are like two hours and whatever. So I know those are probably boring stuff. But I want to talk about medically important gram positive uh, bacilli. Does anybody remember anything about endospore formers? They're generally not uh, uh, pathogenic. Not pathogenic. Uh, but where would we find these? Um, where would they become a problem? In your gut? 
Oh, you got, so we're going to talk about Clostridium difficile. All right, remember we talking about that at all? Maybe, forgot. <clears throat> all right, so endospore formers, and a lot of these are what we actually uh, got uh, penicillin from. So then we're going to talk about some non endosporemers and then some of the irregularly shaped and stained properties of these, like microbacterium. Uh, and next week we'll talk about the really cool stuff, the uh, gram positive, or the gram negative, Pseudomonas, E. coli, things like that. All right, so uh, here's some gram positive um, bacilli. So the spore formers, bacillus and clostridium, so these are the ones we gotta worry about in healthcare because we can't, how can we kill these? Peroxide? It does autoclave. actually. Autoclave. Autoclave, yeah, so peroxide or autoclave. All right, so they're saying now that, uh, you know, bleach is okay, but peroxide will kill it on with long exposure. So uh, uh, peroxide is probably one of your best bets. Right? And we'll talk about uh, uh, bacterium, bacterium, which causes acne here. Can you guys see the pointer at all? Yeah. Okay, mycobacterium is acid fast. All right, we'll talk a little bit about acidomyces at the very end. Not a real big thing. None of us are going to really see that in healthcare right now. So not a major concern right now. All right, so sporeforming bacilli, bacillus, clostridium, um, bacillus. So anything that says B, whatever, or C, whatever, whenever they're saying that is bacillus or clostridium. I'm going to just try to go over the important things because I already know what's on the exam. Strangely enough. So um, if you guys want to take the um, the connect one as practice, if it's still up, I don't know if it still is, or take the other one, it's probably a little bit easier. I know pretty much what's on that exam. So um, whatever. All right, so gram-positive endospore-forming motile rods, mostly saprophytic. Do you guys remember what that means? This can live off of anything in that it doesn't need a living host. So these are saprophytic, they can live in the environment. All right, they're versatile into creating complex macromolecules. So, do you guys remember talking about uh, bioremediation at all? No, a while ago. Okay, so these are um, for bioremediation, these are actually was our initial source of antibiotics. All right. And remember, we talked about that guy who went on uh, vacation in England and he came back. He was going to throw all his plates up. He realized that all this nothing was growing around it because right? these bacteria were giving off all kinds of um, toxins that were killing everything around it. So there was no um, competition. All right. When we talk about C. diff. Do you guys remember me saying anything about C. diff at all? Most of us probably have it. Most of us probably have it. And most of us are probably not going to have a problem with it because why? We've got all the other uh, bacteria in there. Yeah, so if you guys could go to healthy up, enough, healthy enough, and if you went on a, like a um, a huge antibiotic uh, stringent uh, episode and you got rid of all of your microbiota, there'd be no competition for this. All right? We talk about Bacillus anthrax and Thracis. Does that sound familiar at all? Bacillus serious. All right. So B serious is actually an intestinal issue. Bacillus anthracic, there's a couple different types, and you know, we're all worried about uh, what's going on currently, but we really should be more worried about some of these other things we're gonna be talking about today, which are a lot more pathogenic and virulent. So Bacillus anthracis is a large uh, block-shaped rods, central spores that develop under all conditions except in the living body. All right, so these can't live in a living body, generally. And they have virulent factors, <clears throat> so pe uh, polypeptide capsules and exotoxins. So what's the difference between an exotoxin and an endotoxin? Do you remember? Are these gram positive or gram negative? Gram positive. Gram positive. All right. So these are these are excreting these toxins constantly. So when we talk about some. Uh, bacillus cereus or some of these food poisonings, remember, these are giving off toxins. So you're not going to be infected with these. They're going to give off toxins. You're going to be intoxicated from the food poisoning. And uh, bacillus cereus is extremely important. And we probably all have likely had it. 
So you eat something, you're not sure what is going on. Maybe you ate at Louis or wherever at four in the morning for whatever reason. And you got sick. And the next day you're throwing off, you're taking a lot of stuff, you're flushing it out. Not a huge deal. You didn't get infected with that uh, bacteria. It's giving off exotoxins as it's living. The toxins are what's making you sick, right? So here's Bacillus anthracis or anthrax. Um, most of you are probably too young to remember what happened with that um, years and years ago. But cutaneous, what does cutaneous mean? I was talking about subcutaneous or cutaneous. In the skin. In the skin. skin. So spores enter through the skin. All right, anything that, when you ever see a scar anywhere in your future, it means black. All right, so these are the least dangerous. Pulmonary were inhaling these spores, and that's what they were doing when they were mailing this to all these people. They were hoping they would open these letters and inhale these spores. All right. Gastrointestinal is with ingest these spores. So it was very, very um, lethal. They were trying to wipe out certain populations with this. Right. So we treat it with penicillin, tetracycline, or uh, ciprofloxacin. Like I said, in this course, I'm not concerned with you guys remember. Uh, what we're using to treat each thing, but I really want you to kind of know um, the, the method of these, how they work. All right. And then we have vaccines to this. Live spores are toxic to prevent, protect livestock because this is in the soil. All right, so we want to protect the livestock so they're not spreading this. But what we really want to do is worry about um, for high risk occupations like military personnel um, or annual boosters. So. Um, we're not worried about what's going on right now, but if we really wanted to wipe out some, for somebody, we could, if we put anthrax in the air, then we would really want to start wearing masks and being very, very cautious. Now, Bacillus cereus is common airborne, dustborne, usually me uh, methods of disinfection, antiseptic are ininfective, right? So this is what grows in food. Spores survive cooking and reheating, because remember, if unless we're doing then remember the other method we had other than um, autoclaving. If we wanted to, to do a, like a three day process, can you remember what that was called? Pendulization. Wow, who was that, Ian? Oh, yeah. I can't see, but I, can, I, am, I know your voice. All right, the so pendulization for that. So ingestion of toxin containing food causes nausea, vomiting, abdominal cramps, diarrhea, and 24 hour duration. So, like I said, a lot of us have probably had this. Uh, we thought it was food poisoning. It is food poisoning. Remember, you're not infected with this. It's it's exotoxin. So as it's growing on the intestines, it is releasing these toxins in your uh, gut, causing all these symptoms. And the problem we have with with increasing reported with immunosuppressed people, right? And you know we're seeing that currently. People who are immunosuppressed are having some major major problems. So are we um, <clears throat> clostridium, and it's like C. diff or C whatever is always clostridium. Gram positive spore forming rods, anaerobic and catalase negative. So what does anaerobic mean, you guys? Uh, don't need oxygen. Yeah, it doesn't need it or it can live without it. All right, so where does C. diff live, Katerina? I can't believe I can't see you guys. It's not as much fun. <clears throat> All right, so there's 120 species. Oval or spheroid spores produce only under anaerobic conditions. So these have to be in an environment where there's not a lot of oxygen, right? So some of these, if we wanted to kill them, if we just hit them with oxygen, they can't really um, deal with that very well. Right, so these synthesize organic acids, alcohols, and exotoxins. So they're very toxic to the, the human body. Cause wound infections, tissue infections, and food intoxication. A sodium for fringes. You guys have heard of gas gangrene? Gangrene, nothing. All right. This is the most frequent clostridial involvement in soft tissue and wound infections causes myonecrosis. What does myo always mean? Muscle. Muscle, necrosis, death. So these actually have to be, clostridium for fringes has to be. Um, deep in your tissue. So it has to be around where there's no oxygen. So if you look here, I have spores found in soil, human skin, intestine, and vagina, but predisposing factors, surgical incisions, compound fractures, 
diabetic ulcers, septic abortions, puncture wounds, and gunshot wounds. What do those all have in common? They all break your first line of immunity. They first, first line of immunity, and they go all the way through deep into the tissue where the oxygen concentration is much, much lower. All right, so these can't live on the outside. They have to be, they have to be injected into the skin. They have to be in a non-oxygenated environment. So some of the variants, we have alpha toxin causes red blood cell rupture, edema, and tissue destruction. So this is called gas gangrene. You don't want to guess why? It's going to be, it starts literally uh, uh, digesting your dead necrotic tissue. We had a wound or something happened. It's digesting that for, for food. It's fermentating. If it's fermentating something, what is it producing? Going to produce some kind of gas, right? Gas gangrene. So it, causes, it produces collagenase, hyaluronidase, and DNAs. You guys remember that from strep or staph? It starts eating through your tissue. <clears throat> its patho uh, pathogenicity is not highly invasive, requires damaged or dead tissue in anaerobic conditions. Right? If you look here, that's someone's leg. Nasty, right? Conditions stimulate spore germination, vegetative growth, and release of exotoxins and other virulence factors. And like I said, it's going to ferment your muscle carbohydrates, result in formation of gas and further tissue destruction. So how do you think we can kill this from what we just talked about? Hyperbaric oxygen. Nice. Ian must have skipped forward. Nice. Didn't. I knew that. Oh, nice. All right. So if we hit it with oxygen, nice. We can kill it. Immediate cleansing of dirty wounds, deep wounds, um, infected incisions. All right, so we have to clean it all out, debride it. Large doses of penicillin, hyperbaric oxygen therapy, and there's no vaccinations in there. So what they're doing is they're going in, they're cleaning out the wound, and they're hitting with some oxygen. Because this can't, it's anaerobic, it can't deal with oxygen. So we hit it with enough oxygen, it'll kill it. All right. uh, tetanus. You guys have all had a tetanus shot? No, well, maybe. All right, common resident of soil and GI tracts of animals causes tetanus or lockjaw or neuromuscular disease. All right, so if somebody had tetanus, what would be a sign or symptom other than lockjaw? Nothing. All right, most common among geriatric patients because they have a, a decreased immune system and IV drug abusers, decreased immune system, neonates in developing countries. So there are also cases of, and I wish Dr. Rowe was here. She, she worked in Alabama, I guess. She had a couple of uh, cases of this, but <clears throat> I guess people used to chew off the umbilical cord. Yeah, gross. And the people would get infected with this. Gross. Yeah. Alabama. You betcha. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, my great great grandparents were from Alabama. Yeah. I mean, open. I admit that openly. Yeah. Awesome. All right. So uh, spores usually enter through accidental puncture wounds. So you're puncturing it. You're breaking that first line of defense. Burns, umbilical stumps. Right. Literally, they're biting this off. All right. Frostbite and crushed body parts. You're crushing it. You're uh, penetrating that first line of defense. Anaerobic environment is required for vegetative cells to grow and release toxins. And Dr. Rowe told us a story when I took the course in 93, I think, of this couple, I guess they uh, conceived their child in a hammock, so they thought it would be kind of cool to birth the child in the same hammock. And the father literally chewed the umbilical cord off. I can't make this shit up. And they got totally, kid got, Oh, <laughs> All right, so tetanospasm. All right, so I'm going to ask you guys on your exam the difference between tetanus and what's the other one that's similar to this? If something can't cross the synaptic cleft. You know what the disease that is? Well, we'll get to it. Not a problem. All right, tetanospasm neurotoxin causes paralysis by binding to the motor nerve endings, blocking the release of neurotransmitter or muscular contraction inhibition, muscles can contract uncontrollably. So with lock jaw, the, the masseter, the, the jaw muscles contract, and literally there are cases where people have cracked their teeth 
right? So please remember when you have a muscle contraction, like if you're contracting your biceps, your triceps are also working to inhibit that because we don't want full muscle contraction, all right? That's lethal. Right? You'll break, you start breaking bones. So then the um, neurotoxin uh, binds to the uh, inhibitor of this and causes over contraction. Death most often due to paralysis of respiratory muscles. So what do you think gets um, paralyzed? Diaphragm, right? Diaphragm, your scalenes, right? This is neonatal tetanus, so this baby literally is in the extended position. Right. So treatment uh, aimed at uh, deterring degree of toxemia and infection and uh, maintaining homeostasis. So what we're going to do is we're going to give them antitoxin. But remember, the antitoxin, like an antibody, we can bind to the toxin, but we can't already we can't clear what's already there. Right. So therapy with human tetanus immune immunoglobulin. Inactivates circulating toxin, but does not counteract what's already bound. Right. Vaccine's available. You get a booster shot every 10 years. So remember, whether you've been vaccinated or not, if you should be vaccin or vaccinated every 10 years or so, or if you are outside and you cut yourself <clears throat> with shears or a shovel or anything in the soil, it might be a good idea to go and get vaccinated again, just in case. All right, C. diff. We all know what this is. Yes, maybe. Let's see, you guys, so I'm going to assume you're listening. <clears throat> Normal resident of the colon in low numbers, right? The only time it becomes a problem is we wipe out all of the other um, microbes in the gut, and this has no competition. It causes antibiotic associated colitis, <clears throat> relatively non invasive. Treatment with broad spectrum antibiotics kills the other bacteria, allowing C. diff to overgrow. Reduces enterotoxins and damages the intestines. So this is also releasing those exotoxins, causes, you guys familiar with leaky gut syndrome? Well, when you're done with the course, you might want to think about uh, reading up on that. All right, so a lot of the uh, GMOs and a lot of the food out there is, is well, is relatively toxic, causing leaky gut syndrome. So it's causing your intestinal wall to allow things in that it really shouldn't be in. This also allows things in, starts making the tissue very um, inflamed, allowing things in that you really shouldn't let into your intestines can cause a lot of things going on. This is enterotoxins that damage intestines. All right, so <clears throat> when you ever see entero, what does that mean? Okay, entero means intestines, all right? What does exo means? It's releasing it in the environment. Entero always means, like entero bacteria, entero always means digestive tract. Right? So when you guys are done with the course, when you're taking NCLEX or whatever you're taking, um, remember these, these parts of these words will, will clue you into what's going on. Major cause of diarrhea in hospitals, increasingly common in community acquired diarrhea, nursing homes or hospitals, I have never had the distinct pleasure of smelling this, but apparently once you smell it, um, it's something you can't really forget. So there's a normal large intestine that is completely, if you look, it's completely inflamed from those exotoxins or enterotoxins, and there's some inflammation going on. Mild uncomplicated cases <clears throat> respond to fluid and electrolyte replacement with raw of antimicrobials. All right, you guys remember me how me telling you how we can we can also get rid of this. No, if you were going to give someone a fecal transplant, remember this at all. So can, there's a thing out there now where you can get a fecal transplant. You can go in, <clears throat> you can get it from a, logically, or you can get it from somebody that you're that you know is safe, and you can go in and, and re inoculate your microbiota with with someone else's intestinal contents and it'll start reproducing it'll kind of um push away the c diff so you give someone else your poop pretty much is that gotta be brianna <laughs> yeah, yeah pretty much you um yeah pretty much cool yeah it's been uh it's been done but how do they 
How do they administer that? Swap meet, like two people meet up and they're like, trade. <laughs> no, I think it's a capsule form. <laughs> I don't really know. <sighs> uh, yeah, yeah, but there's such thing as a fecal transplant. Uh, yeah, make sure it's somebody you know. Make sure they're um, relatively clean. date first. Yeah, take it first before you just give me your poop. Like. Uh, yeah, we're not gonna talk about scatter. You know, you're like, <laughs> okay. All right. I can't see you guys. This is no fun at all. All right, clostridium uh, botulism, rare uh, but severe intoxication, usually from uh, home canned foods. All right, so if you guys were going shopping at Wegmans or Tops or Aldi's or wherever, would you buy a dented can? No. Why? Uh, there's a chance it could be popped open. Right. I don't know. So what they're finding out with this, so uh, clostridium for fringes and, and clostridium botulae are endospore formers, right? We talked about it before. Now we're going to take these and we're going to talk about how they could possibly cause uh, making you sick through ingestion. So if you're going to uh, make to say you were going to make um, uh, home canned beans or tomatoes or something like that. So you're you're getting this from the soil, or whatever. You're going to can it. If you don't bring that to a high enough temperature and pressure, like an autoclave, you're going to can this. You have to bring it to a like you're canning it. You have to bring it to a certain pressure to kill the endospores. All right. <clears throat> so now you have them on the shelf. All right. And you haven't killed them. What kind of oxygen concentrations in these cans right now? Pretty low. These are anaerobic. So what's happening is these endospores are reproducing in the can while it's sitting on the shelf. Then you consume this, and these remember these endospores are giving off these toxins constantly. It can make you very very sick. Right? Rare but severe intoxication, usually from home canned food, right? or um, if somebody has a dented can, they can let air in, and these things will start like endospores. We said they'll come back to life if everything changes. So what happens is some of these endospores in the can, they'll come back causing um, severe sickness. Clostridium for fringes, we said this causes gas gangrene, but to mild intestinal illness, second most common form of food poisoning worldwide. So any of these clostridial um, bacteria, they're anaerobic and they'll live in the cans on your shelf. And then when you go to consume them, they're excreting these exotoxins. It can make you very, very sick. You know, hopefully you'll just um, throw up, get sick, uh, flush this out of your system. Hopefully. Right. So botulism is intoxication associated with inadequate uh, food preservation. And I'll call you botulism, uh, spore forming, anaerobic, commonly inhabits soil and water. Some people are canning this stuff and they're maybe not cleaning it off or off, or they're cleaning it off very well. But all it takes is a few spores in that can. You don't kill them while they're on the shelf for a year, two years, three years, or whatever. They're reproducing, or they'll reproduce once you open the can. They'll, they'll say the environment looks good. They'll start sporulating and coming back. Spores are present in food when gathered and processed. If reliable temperature and pressure are not achieved, air will evacuate, but spores will remain. Anaerobic conditions favor spore germination and vegetative growth. It's a potent toxin. Botulinum is released. All right, so where else have we seen botulism? Botox. Botox. So what does that do? I mean, what, what's the yeah. rationale behind it? So whether we want to get rid of wrinkles. It prohibits you right. from making the muscle, it constricts the muscles. It doesn't allow the muscles to move. In fact, I just got some today. Thank you very much. <laughs> Okay, Dawn? Yes. Oh, nice. <laughs> forehead or where? Where? Or we're not yeah, I, yeah, I get it in my forehead and my glabella. I need some too. I'm only going to be 57 next month. I started in my 30s. Oh. Do you get it for migraines or do you get it for like cosmetic for reasons? Cosmetic. If you work for a dermatology office, it must be discounted. Of course it is. <laughs> oh, well. It used to be. When I started there, it used to be free. Now it's now I have to pay, but it's still a lot. Wow. Yeah. 
Yeah. Serena, why did you say for migraines? Um, You're right, I do want to know what your... My cousin gets them, and I almost used to get them because I don't know yeah, what my girlfriend that. does too. But you get a lot more though. So like I only get like one, two, three, yeah. four, five, six. I get like seven or eight injections, but like for the migraine, it's in the back of your head where they do them, and it's like 60 something injections. Like my girlfriend gets it done, and she's like, it's so painful. Like she also gets, she used to get it cosmetically. And she's like, no, I, I, she's like, it's awful for the migraines. They do like 60 injections. And she said, it's horrendous. I want to ask you guys why that is. It's true. What is it? Well, what's causing it? They use it for, I knew this girl on my rowing team and she got injections into her armpits because for excessive. Yes. Yeah. Yep. For hyperhidrosis. <laughs> yep. And it, that too. it basically either paralyzes the neurons in the area so that they can't feed the muscles to contract or they paralyze them in a given position, I'm pretty sure. But it works the same way with sweat glands, like they're no longer like innervated, so they can't act as much anymore. Oh. And it wears off. Yeah. But why, why does it work for migraines? That I don't know. I never got. Okay, so who has migraines, Katerina? Yeah. Okay, so there's a few females in the class. All right, so every 20 to 30 days, what happens with females? Aunt Ruby comes to town. <laughs> Aunt Ruby comes to town. Okay, whatever. Okay. So, all right. So, I, you know, it's funny. I always, I always bring this up in class or path up or micro. So, what causes the cramps? Uterine constrictions, like actually vasoconstriction in your uterus to shed the lining. Yeah. And what's happening to the blood supply? It's getting cut off. Cutting off. So, what? Is your uterus, is it, it's muscle tissue, right? Mm -hmm. so you're stopping the blood flow to the uterus causing contractions. So in the back of your neck or your, your head, so I could do brain surgery on all of you and you wouldn't feel anything, all right? When you have a migraine, it's literally the, do they make you learn all the muscles of your scalp when you were in a &P? Unfortunately not. They didn't, okay. Well, all those, the frontalis and temporalis and masseter, all those muscles there. When your muscles, and you get tension headache or your muscles in the back of your neck constrict, remember your arteries, veins, and nerves one and a triad of three. So when they constrict, it cuts off the blood supply, causing those muscles to cramp. That's what causes your headache and migraine. So when they give you the Botox, all right, the muscles in the back of your neck or the surrounding area can't contract. You have complete blood flow to the other muscles. That's what causes the diminished migraines. Right? Can you guys still see the screen? Because I can't. I don't know what happened. Oh, it's black. I can't swear because we're recording this. I don't think that's going to stop me. All right. <laughs> all right. So anyway, here is the Botox toxin is carried to the neuromuscular junction, blocks the release of acetylcholine necessary for contraction. I remember talking about this before, you know, we, we had to do this all online. I remember I said that. Uh, how could, what else could you get this confused with? So tetanus and Botox, they work completely different, but a botulism or Botox stops the calcium from coming in, all right, crossing here, you guys remember uh, going down the T tubules, nothing, calling the contraction. So literally can't cross the neuromuscular junction. All right, causes double or blurred vision, difficulty swallowing neuromuscular symptoms. So um, remember causing double vision or, or blurring because the ciliary muscles of your iris, the crystalline lens get paralyzed, or right, difficulty swallowing your uh, hypoglossal muscle, your uh, diaphragm can get um, and some major, major problems with this too, right? Infant botulism caused by ingested spores that germinate and release toxin causing flaccid paralysis, all right? So with an infant, what do you never feed a baby? Honey. Honey or crack cocaine or whatever. You never, give, you never give them honey because there are spores in it. You know, you can have spores in it. And if you do, you have floppy baby syndrome. This is a real thing. The baby will not be able to contract muscles. You'll have like a rag doll baby. 
and it it goes away. We can give them antitoxins, and it can go away. But you never give a baby honey. Wound botulism spores enter wounds and cause food poisoning type symptoms. So it's, it's excreting all of those exotoxins. And so we can administer the antitoxin, <clears throat> cardiac and respiratory support if we need to. Like I said, it, the heart is a muscle. It can slow down, or your diaphragm can slow down and cause major problems. Okay. Practice proper methods of preserving and handling canned food, addition of uh, preservatives. You can stop that from growing. All right, clostridial, uh, oh, I can't hear, somebody saying something? No. All right, clostridium for fringes. What else did this cause? It can cause gastroenteritis, but what was the major, it causes gas gangrene. All right, but if you consume it, spores, uh, contaminate food that has not yet been cooked thoroughly enough to destroy spores. Spores germinate and multiply, especially if it's on refrigerated in the food. You consume this, and remember, these are giving off spores, and in your digestive tract, the oxygen concentration is diminished. Right? So when consumed, toxin is produced, and the intestines acts on epithelial cells, causes leaky gut syndrome, acute abdominal pain, diarrhea, and nausea, and hopefully you'll get sick, throw it up, Flush it out. So remember, if you guys are eating something and you get sick, you say, oh, I just got sick. Well, that's a good thing. All right, the worst thing you're going to do is eat something that's bad for you and not throw up. So don't ever be afraid, as unpleasant as it is, don't ever be afraid to throw up. Your body's just saying something's not right. You want to throw that up and get it out of the system. You want an abort mission immediately. We'll talk about gram positive, regular, not, these are non spore forming bacilli, right? Regular stain uniformly and do not assume theomorphic shape, so they're relatively consistent. Does anybody remember me saying anything about listeria? No? I did mention it though, right? Several times, maybe? Yes, you have. I have. All right. So um, if any females in the room become pregnant, all right, what should you never eat? You never change the cat litter box. That's all crap. But you should never eat lunch meat. All right. They always say, like, if you never want to um, eat lunch meat because literally this is in intestines of animals. And I don't know if you guys know how your food is processed or made, but these, they literally gut these animals. And the fecal contents are sprayed all over the meat. So, Listerio, what is a monocyte? You guys remember that from? 15, 16, 17. Monocytes, they leave the bloodstream and they become nothing. Vertricles? Close. Macrophages. All right, let's do monocytogenesis. All right, so these literally, these I said before, at the beginning of class, these trick your macrophages and monocytes into ingesting them. How is that advantageous? Uber ride. Nice. Who said that, Katerina? Yeah. Nice. Yes, free Uber ride anywhere they want. And I can't pronounce this. I won't even try to. This lives in the tonsils of healthy pigs. So if you're on a farm and you get bit by a pig, you might want to get this checked out. Okay, just saying. All right, so Listeria monocytogenesis, non spore forming, gram positive. Ranges from coxobacilli to long filaments, right? But here's the deal. It's resistant to cold, heat, salt, pH streams, and bile. You guys remember me saying anything about bile before? It inhibits, it inhibits most gram-positive bacteria except listeria. Right? Listeria can grow in it. Virulence is attributed to ability to replicate in the cytoplasm of cells after inducing phagocytosis. So it literally taunts the macrophage and monocyte into ingesting it and it avoids humoral immune system because the immune system is not going to go after one of its own right? so these literally they <clears throat> through phagocytosis they go in they start replicating now they can leave any time they want and what, what's all this stuff in the end here these are for jello these things can can go anywhere they want right Primary reservoir in soil and water and animal intestines. That's where we have the problem. 
All right, so they're gonna gut these chickens, uh, cows, whatever, pigs. They gut them in these feedlots. It sprays all over. You can't get rid of all of it. And it, it grows through pH, salt, uh, all these things we try to do to clean it. And it's growing in the refrigerated case, the tops, Wegmans, dashes, wherever you're going, it can grow in there. All right. If you're healthy, your immune system's great, not a problem, but this can be um, transmitted vertically. Do you guys remember what that is? Vertical transmission? The placenta, all right? So not a good idea. Can contaminate foods and grow during refrigeration. Listeriosis may cause us associated with dairy products, poultry and meat. And this, there's cases of this literally growing on your ice cream, folks. So be careful. Often mild or subclinical in normal adults. Immunocompromised patients, fetuses, neonates, affects brain and meninges, 20% death rate. So most, pe most of us would just kind of get sick, throw it up. But if you're immune compromised, organ transplant, you have something else going on, your immune system's already um, dealing with other things, can cause a major problem. Culture requires a long, lengthy, cold enrichment process. All right, and we're just gonna go on using ELISA test, DNA analysis. You wanna know exactly what it is as soon as possible. You wanna treat that immediately. Here's our erythro, uh, all right, this is, um, like I said, I can't pronounce it. Primary reservoir is a tonsil of healthy pigs. Enters through skin abrasion, multiplies, and produces red, dark regions. All right, erythros means red. So this person got bit by a pig or whatever. It was on the tonsils. Um, I've only seen them on board questions two or three times, but it's been known to do that. All right, <clears throat> corneal bacterium. Do you guys know what that is? Diphtheria. PTAP vaccination. Right, we'll talk about this. This causes acne. All right, microbacterium can cause tuberculosis. Acidomyces is kind of a skin disease. And we'll talk about those as quick as possible. I'll let you guys go as soon as I can here. All right, corneal bacterium diphtheriae, gram positive, irregular bacilli. All right, <clears throat> this causes palisades. You guys remember me in lab talking about this? It's kind of like that uh, picket fence that's broken, kind of. It lays like this. These are palisade shapes. Reservoir of healthy carriers, potential for diphtheria is always present. So here's what happens. Grandma, mom, or whatever has this in their throat, they can infect the baby. All right, diphtheria causes a major problem with the cilia, mucus. Um, if you've ever, has anyone ever heard of this? Somebody coughing from this? Causes a pseudomembrane. All right, we'll see a picture of this. Most cases occur in non-immunized children being crowded on sanitary conditions, required via respiratory droplets from carriers or active individuals. All right, so here's the thing. This is diagnostic. Can you guys see this here? All right, that literally is almost like leather. All right, and these people will literally suffocate. There's cases in third world countries where they have to literally go in and cut this open the person can breathe. Local infection, upper respiratory tract, inflammation, sore throat, nausea, vomiting, swollen lymph nodes, pseudomembrane formation can cause uh, asphyxiation. So what happens is they have a major, major um, sore throat, nausea, vomiting, and the body is going in and trying to heal that. While it's doing that, it's making this very, very thick um, fibrotic tissue. And these people will literally, they'll suffocate if we don't go in and, and lance it or, or cut it. <clears throat> so diagnostic methods, pseudomembrane swelling is indicative, right? And then just do a uh, ELISA test, do some serological assays. Has anyone gone out and got tested for COVID antibodies? I really want to do it. I, yeah. I'm upset I haven't done that yet because I know I have it. So. I want to get it done, but they said it's going to cost like 150 bucks. Insurance won't cover it. What? Yeah, that's what they're telling me. And I have um, pretty good insurance. And you know what else they're telling me? Don't quote me on this, but they're saying like September, October, November. Uh huh. If you literally don't have the antibody testing or the vaccination, you're not gonna be able to go to any kind of public event. 
So what they're saying is, no, this is, I can't even make this shit up. There's, you're gonna to have to literally have something on your phone to prove you were immunized or you have the antibodies. Well, then that's something that has to be covered then. If it's something that's gonna be required, you have to have coverage for that. Right. I mean, I'm gonna wait until they get it perfected, but here's the thing, I'm like, I, is this gonna be like a concentration camp where they're gonna tattoo me? Whether if I have the end or not, I mean, I, seriously. Mm -hmm. Seriously, this is actually, you know, I. Oh, but yeah, but the thing is, they still don't know how long those antibodies are going to be um, functioning. You know, like this is still so new; they don't know. Th these antibodies might only work for so many months. You do the choir here, Don. I just, I this is my, uh, you know, I know we're recording this, but this is my exercise in. Communism and Simon says, like, how much are we going to take? Yeah. This is 1984. Exactly. Right? Orson Welles, isn't there something like that? Yeah. Uh, George Orwell. Oh, right. Who was it? George Orwell. Right. Animal Farm. Yeah. That was a good one. <laughs> I need to read that. And you guys aren't even born yet. Anyway. Right, so, know, right? <laughs> so, pseudomembrane swelling is indicative. So if you ever see pseudo membrane, it's always going to be diphtheria. Just remember that. It's going to be on your board questions or whatever. It's very, very common. Propionobacterium acne is a common cause of acne. We'll see a picture of this coming up. Common resident of pseudo sebaceous glands causes acne. Microbacterium is acid fast bacilli. So what do you guys know about um, Microbacterium. Did we talk about this at all? Waxy. Waxy it has cord factor, waxy, so the immune system really can't go in and kill it real easily. And if it can't get rid of it, it has to kind of surround it like a sarcophagus, right? And then the problem is if you have this and your immune system's kind of keeping it at bay, you have something else going on, all right? Your immune system kind of leaves to go fight whatever that is, and now the stuff will start draining into your bronchi, your capillary bed, you can get into your respiratory tract and start traveling. Once it becomes uh, tertiary or leaves your, your body, um, leaves the rest of your body, you can get something called military TB. It literally spreads to the rest of your body. Not a good thing at all. So it's strict our uh, aerobics produces catalase, produces, uh, processes mycolic acids. <clears throat> Do not form capsules, flagellar spores. It grows very slowly. You guys remember me saying anything about TB? Long antibiotic treatment. Yeah, because it grow it just only works when it's reproducing. If it grows very, very slowly, six to twelve months. And the problem is, you know, most people don't take the, the treatment for as long as they should. <clears throat> All right. Um, okay. All right. Uh, bacillus produces no exotoxins and enzymes that contribute to infectiousness. All right. <clears throat> so. Um, would you guys would you guys be more afraid of if we had a TB um, outbreak or COVID? TB. 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 All right, but what if I told you that twenty percent of the population has TB? I believe you because it's natural flora. <laughs> yeah. I don't know about that. That's not really good testing for TB. Yeah, and the, it only takes like the effective dose for TB is like 15, I think, 15 or 20. It doesn't take a whole. Mm -hmm. Yeah, virulence factors contain complex waxy and cord factors that prevent destruction by lysosomes and macrophages. So even if it's in your lungs, or right, unless your immune system is really active, um, it's very hard for them to get through these waxy um, waxes and this cord factor is literally protein. It's not quite a capsule, but it's very, very hard for the lysosomes to get in there and the macrophages to get rid of it. Does everyone hear any uh, PPD test or anyone? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. We administer them for like people that are on biologics and stuff. We have to test them for that before they can be allowed to be prescribed them. All right. So if it comes down, if it comes back positive, do they have to be sent them off for checks or X-rays or what do they do? Um. Yeah. I, it's pretty much handed over to their primary. Um, and then if everything's cleared or whatever, then, you know, but we can't even, you know, prescribe the biologic until they're cleared of that. Like they can't start taking it. So, which we don't even really deal with much of that anymore. We used to years ago, but now 
we really just more specialize in just skin cancer. We, we the psoriasis patients, we kind of hand over to other dermatologists. Yeah. So we don't really, we don't have too many cases of that anymore, but we used to years ago. What about eczema? Deal with that too? Um, yeah, I mean, we deal with it if we have to, if it's an existing patient, but we don't take new patients for general derm stuff. Yeah, I just want to talk about this for a minute here. Like, pre those factors include uh, adequate nutrition, debilitating, debilitation of the immune system. So these people have, you know, they're either, yes, you know, they yes. could be alcoholics, they could have poor hygiene, they could be, um, you know, I'm not going to dwell on like immigrants or whatever, but if they have, if they're going through several countries trying to get wherever it happens to be, all right, they're gonna, you know, they're exposed to it, um, living in crowded, dirty conditions, they're gonna get that, and they can come to the U.S. and they can be harboring this, right? Poor access to medical care, lung damage, and genetics. You know, they're saying, you know, there's some populations who are more prone to this. Estimate a third of the world population in 15 million in the U.S. carry tuberculosis bacillus. I used to in the U.S occurring in recent immigrants. Now, a lot of them have had the bovine um, vaccine to this, all right? So even if we were to test them, we're gonna test positive for it because they, they've they already been exposed to it. So how does the PPD test work? If they're positive, they it swells up. But right. it, so it's testing to see if they have it in their system. It's not showing if it's active or whatever, but it's showing that they've been exposed to it. All right, guys, there's about six of you on the call right now. So how does it work? It's a subcutaneous injection of like a derivative of the protein. It's a like the PPD stands for protein purified derivative, but if, mm -hmm. like if it does swell up, it shows that your body is reacting to it or it already has the actual antibodies made for it that react to what you're injecting them with? Yeah, so you know, we kind of talked about before, if you had B cells that were producing antibodies, you already have the recipe and memory cells, all right? So if you've never been exposed to it before and we do the PPD test, and you go back 48 to 72 hours later, you don't have a swelling in the skin. What does that mean? If you don't have swelling, you haven't had TB. Right, because you it would take your body, remember we said that, that curve, it takes a minimum of like seven to 10 days before you start even making the antibodies if you find the right B cell to it. So if you go and have that done and you don't have any swelling, we can say, you know what? You don't have any antibodies to it, you're um, tighter, you don't have a tighter to it. So we can kind of say, if you swell up 48 to 72 hours later, we can say, you know what? You already had it. You have memory cells to it and antibodies to it. That's great. All right, and we send you out for checks, x-ray, and check. Very good. I just want to get that point across. All right, 5 to 10% of infected people develop clinical disease. Untreated disease progresses slowly. Majority of TB cause, or causes contained, or cases are contained in the lungs. All right, so here's a problem. We have primary TB, not a huge deal. Um, if your immune system can't get rid of it, we kind of, like I said, we... Uh, Sequester it, have all these uh, macrophages all around it, just holding it at bay. Secondary tuberculosis, reactivation of reinfection. So, TB and something else goes along. Let's say, God forbid, you have cancer or a major illness, your immune system kind of gets diverted, right? And you can reactivate that same infection. Hopefully, you'll get better and we'll, we'll keep it at bay. It'll become primary again or disseminated is the problem, we have extra pulmonary TB. So this literally gets into your bloodstream, travels everywhere in your body, and they call it military TB because it literally looks like um, somebody shot you with birdshot. You guys familiar with birdshot? Yeah. <clears throat> so here's primary TB, infectious dose is 10 cells. You know, 10, 15, 20, someone coughs, whatever. That's all it takes. Phagocytose by alveolar macrophages, and multiply intracellularly. And I think these are the same alveolar macrophages that COVID-19 likes to attach to too. I think I, I think I got that right. <clears throat> After three to four weeks, the immune system attacks forming tubercles, right? Granulomas consisting of a central core containing bacilli surrounded by white blood cells or a tubercle. You guys heard of a tubercle? Yeah. 
All right, um, you can have a gone tubercle in your uh, apex of your lung. And not to be gross, but my second cadaver in grad school had TB. We, we opened up the lungs, we cut it open, and literally, without being gross, these things look like great big things of um, large, you know, cottage cheese can get the large curd or small curd. Mm. Yeah, exactly. I was like, oh, gagging. Both lungs completely gross. So it's called a tubercle. And the center of tubercle breaks down into necro necrotic caseous cheesy lesions, they gradually heal by calcification. So if we go in and we take an x-ray of them, do a chest x-ray, what do you think if the caseous necrosis, meaning dead, gradually heal by calcification, your body goes in, it can't really heal it, but it, it goes in and, and calcifies it. What is that gonna look like in an x-ray? Brown glass, like granules. Yeah, if it's, if it's uh, at the very, very bottom, or if it's a tuber, it's gonna look very, very white because um, calcium is very, very dense. So when the x-ray hits it, it can't go through. And uh, anything that's dark is very, very light. If it's white, it literally absorbs all the x-ray and it turns very, very white. And I think we have a picture of it. Uh, come up here in a second. So secondary TB, if the patient doesn't recover from primary tuberculosis, reactivation of bacilli can occur. Like I said, something is uh, pulling your immune system away. Tubercles expand and drain into the bronchial tubes and their upper respiratory tract. Gradually, the patient experiences more severe symptoms. Violent coughing, greenish and bloody sputum, fever, anorexia, weight loss. They used to call it consumption that literally would consume your entire body and fatigue. So if you see some of these old movies in England or whatever, when they had a lot of the um, TB, people would be very, very gaunt and they'd be literally coughing up green sputum and blood. It destroys the lungs. Untreated, there's a 60% mortality rate. You guys have ever heard of the Catskills? Yeah, they used to send people, they had, they had um, TB, they'd send them to the Catskills because they thought the, the fresh air would, you know, a lot of them felt a little better in the sun and the TB. And um, what's the place, the Hotel Henry, that's the uh, old psych center? They used to have literally hallways where they have the patients in wheelchairs out in the sun. They thought that that would help them with that too. All right. There's a problem, extra pulmonary TB. During secondary TB, bacilli disseminate to the regional lymph nodes, kidneys, long bones, general tract, brain, meninges. These complications are grave. What does that mean? Die. They die, they're in the grave, yes. So literally the lymph nodes become calcified. All these areas become uh, infected and they become calcified. So it's not, it's not good. And then here's a mannitol test, the T, uh, purified uh, protein derivative. And like I said before, 48 to 72 hours in duration. We know if there's swelling that your, what kind of cells are gonna carry that to your um, immune system? Remember your antigen presenting cells, your dendritic cells, just carrying that. <clears throat> All right, here's an x-ray. If you look here, there's a tubercle. See how calcified that is? Here's your heart shadow, All right? This is a great big, that's a tubercle right there. That's very, very calcified. And then the, pro or the um, antibiotic course for this is six to 24 months, All right? The factor is the, was common or used to be, I don't know what they're using now. All right. And here's the vaccine now. A lot of they're using microbacteria and bovis from cow in other countries to give you at least some kind of um, exposure to it. And that's the only reason they're saying that <clears throat> this new um, SARS type two is so prevalent is because we don't have any um, even remotely uh, similar antibodies to this for most people. Still a coronavirus, we have with SARS and MERS, and now we have this. And you know, they're I guess they're estimating in a year or two that we may get our third strain of whatever. But we'll look at right. And then we'll talk a little bit about leprosy. Everyone familiar with leprosy? We all read the Bible, more or less. Whatever. All right, so here's the thing: leprosy is not as contagious as they used to they used to think. I just watched. Has anyone seen the um, series, The Last Kingdom? 
know, way better than Game of, way better than Game of Thrones. Just saying. But they literally they wanted to invade this colony, so they literally put these lepers on top of all the stuff they wanted to hide, and like nobody would go near them. It was brilliant. So it's a strict parasite has not been grown on artificial media or tissue, right? So this we can't grow in the lab. We can't really study it. They don't even know how it's transmitted. They know it likes the dendritic cells and the cutaneous cells because they're cooler. It doesn't like warm. It won't go deep. It won't go in the middle of the body. It's too warm for them, right? Uh, the cells grow in these little packets called globi. Slowest growing of all species. So this takes two to seven years to even grow. Causes starts destroying um, everything superficial. Starts destroying all of your. Um, dendritic cells as far as um, your sensory cells. Right? So these people start losing digits. They lose, they can't feel hot or cold. There's a couple of different types of this. Causes leprosy, a chronic disease that begins in the skin and mucosal membranes and progresses into the nerves. Doesn't go deep though. Doesn't like the warm. And this is the other one. If they ever ask you, this is another one that has a, usually it's only in humans. It's the other one that um, can be transmitted by armadillo, or no, by uh, armadillos. Yeah, armadillos are the only other reservoir for this. Just weird fact. Hmm. Endemic regions throughout the world. Mechanism of transmission is not fully verified. They don't even know how this is transferred. Not highly virulent. It appears that healthy and living conditions influence susceptibility in the course of disease. And I, uh, I think it's in Hawaii. The leper colony. Yeah. They used to send them all to this one of the islands in Hawaii. I can't remember, no, not Maui, one of those. There was a leper colony, but no one lives there anymore. Right. Right. <clears throat> so, macrophages, a phagocyte size, the bacteria, but a weakened macrophage or slow T cell response may not kill the um, bacillus. So, the dendritic cells or macrophages go on and they, they recognize them as foreign. But they can't really kill them uh, if their immune system is not real well. Or there's a genetic component to this. So some some genetic factors, these people, um, different genetic groups can't um, kill it off as easily. Incubation is two to five years. This is very, very, very slow. So it's if untreated, the bacteria grow slowly in the skin, macrophages, and swan cells of the peripheral nerves. Right? And there's two um, Two forms, tuberculoid and uh, leopardus. So everyone knows what a leopard looks like, right? Kind of like, you guys know Peg Bundy? No? I'm losing you guys. All right, <laughs> never. Who are you with children? No one ever saw that? Peg Bundy used to wear leopard pants, never mind. All right, so uh, tuberculoid is asymmetrical, shallow lesions, if you look, so it's asymm uh, asymmetrical. Damages the nerves, results in local loss of pain receptors. So these people, they can't feel pain or cold. Right? So it's it can be very very uh, detrimental. They'll if they were in the cold, they'll get frostbite, or they they easily burn because they can't feel any pain. And leopardus. So these look like le supposed to look like leopard spots. We'll see a picture coming up. I think there's somebody. I think she's from India. Like literally, her fingers are uh, the ends of her fingers are completely destroyed. But she has a lot of gold on. Oh, there she is. <laughs> so <laughs> it's true. So has anyone ever been to India? I don't recommend it, but that's how they they um, hold their wealth. They buy gold. So there's gold in their clothing. There's gold all over. That's that's their money currency. So it's common. So leopardus is a deep uh, nodal infection that causes severe disfigurement of the face, extremities. It's very, very widespread. If you look at that, can you be able to, like leper colonies or someone had leprosy. If you ever see pictures of them uh, in the Bible or whatever, they were completely covered with cloth because they it was very, very easy to see this. There was no mistaking it. And diagnosis, numbing in the hands and feet, loss of heat and cold sensitivity, muscle weakness, thickening of the earlobes, chronic stuffy nose. Detection of acid fast bacillus in the skin lesions. Right? So they pretty much know after a year or two that they have it. <clears throat> um, yeah, prevention requires uh, constant surveillance of high risk populations and not spreading it. 
it's nowhere near as, as prevalent as it used to be. <clears throat> and then there's a couple here. So avium, what does avium mean? Birds. Birds, yeah. So third most common cause of death in AIDS patients. These are dated uh, facts, but back in the um, 80s, the mid 80s, um, early 90s, you know, people used to hang out on their roofs and they used to have pigeons and all kinds of birds on the roofs and they, they were spreading this like crazy because these people were immune compromised. Right? You see Marium, it's just uh, people would get this from scraping their hands on concrete swimming pools, right? Uh, and paratuberculosis this is from raw cow's milk. Right? I've seen that um, in the board example too. So there's a swimming pool granuloma. All right, this person was in a, you know, uh, in-ground pool, herpes tub at LA Fitness. I don't know where they got that from. All right, and there's acidomyces. All right, so it's just really a skin disease. Right. I don't think I asked you guys any of this on the uh, exam, but um, I have seen this on a few board exams before. I think that's it. All right, guys, so... Uh, Next week we'll do 19 and then we'll do 20 and then I'll put your uh, last exam online. We did 19. You did? Oh, okay. <laughs> I have no idea what's going on. I can't see anything. It's a black screen. All right, so <laughs> next week we'll do 20 and then, oh, do we have, we're doing 21? We have to do worms and stuff, don't we? Yeah. What? I thought it was just 18, 19, and 20 on the next exam. Is that what it says? That's what I thought it said at least. I could be wrong. I'll look. I think we have to cover worms, though. We have to cover like the uh, round worm, hook worms, tape worms. All the fun stuff. 21 on Blackboard. Yeah. I'm sure what? It says 21 on Blackboard. Okay, yeah, I think we're going to cover Yeah, we have to cover that. Uh, my Blackboard says 18, 19, and 20. Mm, look harder. <laughs> you have to go into the 21 to the folder. Three folders. <laughs> gotcha. yeah. All right. Okay. You guys have any questions? Email me, or if you guys want to have office hours, just let me know. We can always uh, set that up too. What happens if you won't answer your email? <laughs> <laughs> I swear to God, I I don't do it on purpose. I swear to God, I've sent you six emails. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. We've heard that before, Doctor Phil. Yeah, well, just go. Just you, Don. <laughs> Oh, Text okay. documents. <laughs> hey, did you look into that whole pharmacology thing or no? Uh, I talked to Dr. Macedo. She said I have to talk to nursing and uh, biology, but she thinks there's going to be a battle over that. Okay. Um, and I did talk to her as far as nursing. They're not taking any new students in the fall. Um, and I think it has to do with qualified faculty. So right. that's uh, what that's what uh, that's kind of what I got to. Yeah. What do they, you mean they're not taking new students in the fall? No, 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 no. It, See, we had to apply for the nursing program um, by February 15th and take the test and do all that jazz. So I was supposed to be starting in the fall, but in the evening and they decided to cancel the evening program. Well, they just canceled it a couple of weeks ago. So that means that everyone that applied that was planning on going is left sol yeah. because so taking the a2 because mine was postponed yeah yeah it's not okay. no. don't don't mean to cut you guys off but just tried to open the unit three test and it says that it can't find it so uh, <sighs> glad we figured that out now <laughs> yeah we just literally had the same See, problem with I was able to pull it up earlier before we started because I wanted to make no, sure. Wait, I, I can open the one on Blackboard. I can't open the one that's from McGraw. Oh, from you said that's the easier one. So McGraw looking at McGraw, McGraw, McGraw it doesn't harder. Change. McGraw's harder. So if you want to get the practice, I'll open it up. No, no problem. No, the one that I have, it should just be. Uh, yeah, that one I know Blackboard. exactly every single question on it, so that's easier. Okay. Are you sure? It's due May 5th. It's the same test if you guys want to, you know. Is it due May 5th or is it due May 22nd? No, the one due to May 22nd is the one that I didn't want you guys to see. But I tried to, I couldn't, I couldn't, well, that's the, if you want, I can put it back up, Brianna, if you want, but that's where they take McGraw-Hill questions. 
of 115 and it'll, it'll randomize the question. So you might get five of the same, five of the same thing on your test. Okay. What I put up there is the is a version of what I always get. It's a lot easier. But if you, I'll do it either one. It's only gonna take me five minutes to do that. You want the, whichever is the higher. I'm trying to make it easier for you guys because I know it's stressful. Yeah, we like we like easy. Mm -hmm. You want? I'll do it. So. No. You sure. Yep. So just <laughs> take the blackboard one then. Mm -hmm. yeah. So it's 50 questions. They're all the same. They might randomize the, the question order and the answers, but it's all exactly the same. And everything on there, I know I've gone over personally. There'll be no surprises from the textbook. Okay. So if I were to choose, that's the one I would be taking. Okay. Good to know. I have a quick question about lab. Yes. So <laughs> Dr. Hoffman's not gotten back to me yet. So okay. the only thing I can do at this point is give you guys some. Uh, well, Brianna, what are you doing for lab? I was just about to tell you if you want to know anything, I can let you know because I just finished a semester today. I just took my practical today. She's posted everything. Yeah, me too. And if you want to finish it, you could do it. And me and Rachel did it together today, so we're done. So it was like a multiple choice practical, or how did it? How it, did was, it, it was multiple it was, choice. It was all random. Yeah. Like yeah, and it was order. an hour and a half for 30 questions. And some of them were matched with the term, some of them were true or false, some of them were select all that apply for the agar plate. Oh, yeah, I'm done. 93, baby. Nice. Good for you. Good job. Right. I Good will job. Um, get a hold of Karen and see. She's okay. answering me, so just saying. <laughs> She doesn't like you. No, I have. <laughs> <laughs> I love Brianna's sass. I know. I love it. All right, guys. Uh, and I owe our uh, Katerina. You need, you need chapter fifteen PowerPoint, please. Okay. Is it still fifty questions? Yes. How long is this? Is that fifty-five minutes? 75. I gave I was say, it. I said an hour 20. and 20, right? Mm -hmm. I said an hour and 20, I think. For what? An hour and 20. For the practical or for the for the exam? For the exam. <laughs> for the exam, unit three. Oh. <laughs> Thank you. Let me go. No, um, an hour and 20 is good. Don't be. Yeah, of course it is. You can look up every question. <laughs> oh, stop. <laughs> Don't change it then. Garrett, what should I do? Give it an hour 20. Thank you. All right, guys. I was I'm say, calling. don't make us count you down, Garrett. All right. <laughs> Never do that. <laughs> you don't know us. <laughs> yeah. I'll give you the Bye. COVID. <laughs> Bye. Thank you. Bye. 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 everyone. Bye. See you later. Bye.
Let's see here. Thank mm -hmm. you. 